Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Brief History Of, and today we'll be looking at the Battle of Fort Sumter. The odds of surviving 34 hours straight to bombardment are pretty slim, you would think. Unless it's 1861 and you're at Fort Sumter where the total casualties of the bombardment were zero. Which is a good thing, but maybe not if you're a Confederate gunnery commander. Named after General Thomas Sumter, the fort was built following the War of 1812 and is part of a chain of fortifications along the southern coast of the USA. Fort Sumter itself is placed just off the coast next to Charleston, South Carolina. In November 1860, Abraham Lincoln was voted in as President of the United States, in doing so setting off the secession crisis. Being a federal soldier in a fort in the south became a bit of a bad thing as tensions raised with South Carolina seceding in December 1860. This was quickly followed by six more states in February 1861. In the growing tensions, commander of Fort Moultrie, Major Robert Anderson, began to ask the War Department for reinforcements and began to make plans to move his men from the hard to defend Moultrie to either Castle Pickney or the then unfinished Fort Sumter. On the 26th of December 1860, Anderson put his plan into action and transported his troops and their families via rowboat to Fort Sumter. The winter of 1860 and 1861 was tough as supplies were limited and fuel for heat was rationed. South Carolina Governor Francis Pickens essentially started a siege on Sumter by controlling all communications and supplies to the fort. On the 9th of January 1861, the steamer Star of the West attempted to resupply the fort with reinforcements, but was forced away due to being fired upon by Pickens. Anderson was under the strict orders not to fire unless in defence of the fort directly, so was unable to prevent the Star of the West from turning away and sailing off. On the 1st of March, Brigadier General PGT Burgerard arrived in Charleston with the orders from Confederate President Jefferson Davis to take control of the military situation. Immediately, Burgerard continued to mass weapons aimed at the fort. Unsurprisingly, tensions around the fort started to reach fever pitch. As a weird twist of fate, Burgerard had been a gunnery student of Anderson and the two had been good friends at West Point. Just after Abraham Lincoln's inauguration, Anderson on the 8th of March 1861 reported that he had less than six weeks of food supplies left. The garrison spent several weeks held up in the fort not knowing if any relief would materialise from the federal government. By April, the Union troops had positioned 60 guns, but they lacked the numbers of men needed to make use of them. The fort consisted of three levels of enclosed gun positions. Most of the second level was unoccupied, and the rest of the fort's levels were barely manned. Anderson only boasted around 80 men for the defence of the fort. The original purpose of the fort was to provide defence against a seaborne attack, and because of this, Sumter lacked the ability to properly repel an attack from Bergerard's forces. On the 11th of April, Burgerard sent out an envoy to Sumter to demand the fort to surrender. Anderson took a vote from his men and promptly returned a vote of no. Upon receiving the news of the fort's refusal to surrender, Burgerard began to assess how much food Anderson had left and attempted to predict how long the garrison could hold out. At 1am on the 12th of April, Burgerard sent aides Colonel James Chesson, Colonel Chesson and Captain Stephen D. Lee to Anderson with a message stating, if you state the time in which you evacuate Fort Sumter and agree in the meantime that you will not use your guns against us unless ours shall be employed against Fort Sumter, we will abstain from firing upon you. Anderson replied stating that he would vacate the fort by noon April the 15th unless he received new orders or supplies from the federal government. Colonel Chestnut considered this to be too long and replied to Anderson at 3.20am stating, Sir, by the authority of Brigadier General Burgerard commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States, we have the honour to notify you that he will open fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. Anderson showed the officers to their boat and said, If we never meet in this world again, may God grant that we meet in the next. It's kind of sad to think that in an hour's time they'll be trying to kill each other. At 4.30am, a signal shot was fired from a 10-inch mortar placed at Fort Johnson. The signal was to tell the other guns aimed at Sumter to begin the bombardment. One of the first shots were fired by Edmund Ruffin, who was a secessionist and a supporter of slavery. As a side note, he's not someone I'd have round mine for tea. Each gun was set to fire at two-minute intervals in an anti-clockwise direction from Fort Moultrie, Fort Johnson, the floating battery and Cummins Point. 
For several hours Anderson's guns didn't reply, this was in an attempt to conserve ammunition and prevent unnecessary casualties. At 7am once daylight had arrived, Anderson ordered his first return fire, limited to only 6 guns on the lower casemates to reduce the risk to his men from mortar fire. Later on in the morning, the barracks caught fire, this was caused by hot shot, basically cannonballs heated in a red hot furnace. Luckily by the evening, a rain shower had extinguished the fires. Three ships were sighted outside the harbour flying the Union flag. It was hoped that they were the much needed supplies for Sumter, but unfortunately for Anderson, they were headed to Fort Pickens in Florida. As night set in, Anderson ceased his return fire and his men cautiously went to sleep in fear of a land-based attack. Bergerard reduced his barrage to only four shots an hour. On the next morning of the 13th of April, Bergerov returned to a full barrage towards Sumter, almost exclusively firing hot rounds. Subsequently, reigniting the barracks and setting fire to nearly everything else made of wood within the fort. The fires also threatened the fort's gunpowder stores. Many of the Confederate soldiers admired the bravery of Sumter's garrison as they frantically tried to put out the fires as well as return volley. Around 1pm the fort's flag staff was shot down. Colonel Lewis Wigfall took this that the fort had taken enough punishment and decided to take it upon himself to run out to the fort to see if they had surrendered. I should point out that Wigfall undertook this little voyage without Bergerar's knowledge, which meant he was rowing out under the barrage of his own guns. Kind of risky if you ask me. Once Wigfall reached the fort, he learned that Anderson was not ready to surrender. Wigfall persisted and eventually persuaded the garrison to raise the white flag. Bergerard ordered a ceasefire and sent out some aides to the fort. Upon their arrival, they learned about Wigfall's bizarre self-imposed mission. Surprisingly, during the battle, not one soldier lost their life on either side, which must be some kind of miracle or terrible shooting. After some negotiation, it was agreed that the garrison would leave the fort at 12 noon on the 14th of April. As part of the terms of the surrender, Anderson insisted that he would make a 100-gun salute to the US flag. This is the part of the story where someone actually got killed. During the salute, one of the guns discharged prematurely, accidentally killing two men. Being lucky to survive the barrage of 34 hours, they unfortunately met their demise at the hands of their own gun. Shortly after, the garrison were escorted out of the fort and placed on the Confederate steamer Isabel and were later returned to a Union ship waiting outside the harbour. The tattered flag of Sumter was taken back north as a symbol of the battle. This inspired Frederick Edwin Church to paint our banner in the sky. Following the fort's surrender, the North rallied behind Lincoln's calls for a volunteer army to quell the South, thus kicking off the American Civil War. It is widely regarded that Fort Sumter was the first battle of the war and the fort wouldn't be back in the federal government's hands until February 1865. Anderson went on to become a hero of the Union and carried on his career in the Union Army. Bergerard carried on his career with the Confederate Army until the end of the war and interestingly demonstrated cable cars in New Orleans and was granted the patent. Edmund Ruffin, the guy who thought slavery was a good thing and one of the first to fire upon Sumter, shot himself in the head at the end of the Civil War. The Battle of Fort Sumter sadly didn't set the bloodshed free standard for the Civil War as once the war finally ended in 1865, an estimated 620,000 lives were lost. Do you know of any bloodshed-free battles? Let me know in the comments below. Did you enjoy the video? I hope you did. And if that's the case, please click subscribe, like and comment. And also, if you could, it would be absolutely amazing if you could share videos on any type of social media. And also, you can always follow me on Twitter, which is at plainly underscore D. Once again, thank you very much for watching.